Thank you. Good afternoon. So this uh, panel is about the big data and opportunities in, in big data. I'd like to make a couple introductory comments and then uh, introduce the panel, and we'll do some uh, Q&A with the panel. I'm, um, I'm here for this conference as well as uh, IBM is uh, having a centennial event at the Lincoln Center, and I'm just uh, coming from there. And there was a panel there on, uh, on big data. It was interesting to hear a technical specialist quote that uh, enterprises are now swimming in zettabytes of uh, data which uh, for the mathematicians in the room is one followed by 21 zeros. And it uh, impresses me that we're at the letter Z now, so I'm not sure where we go from here. I guess we will truly end up uh, at Google Bytes eventually. <laughs> so um, the other uh, interesting data that uh, was at the conference and is supported by a, a variety of studies is that 50% of CEOs in corporate America say that they don't have the information that they need to make decisions. Another third say that they make decisions on information that they don't fundamentally trust. Those are staggering percentages, given that business intelligence and analytics has been with us for 20 years and billions of dollars have, have been spent. So the subject of this panel is uh, where are the opportunities in the future to help, uh, to help close that gap. So uh, joining me here are, uh, are four distinguished uh, gentlemen, and I'll uh, start to, down at the end with uh, Clint Johnson. Clint is a... Uh, VP of Customer Solutions at a company called Alpine Data Labs in the uh, analytical application space. Before uh, Alpine, uh, Clint was a uh, senior vice president of uh, data warehousing and analytics at Zions Bank. And uh, next to him is uh, Robert Thomas, who is uh, VP of Business Development uh, in the IBM Information Management Division. This is a $7 billion revenue division, representing about a third of IBM's uh, total software revenues. And next is Todd Papu Uanu, who is an EIR at uh, Battery Ventures, and before Battery was a VP, Distinguished Fellow, and Chief Cloud Architect uh, at Yahoo, and uh, a good friend of uh, the firm. And finally, uh, Dr. Kodrowski, who's an investor, entrepreneur, and writer, and uh, active angel investor, as you'll hear in just a moment. So I'd like to kick things off with, uh, with a slide, if, uh, if we could put that up. This is... Um, Mr. Thomas's uh, uh, creation. This uh, just gives you a little bit of idea of uh, how uh, IBM and, and others in the industry are looking at the world of, of big data. You see a stack here that basically uh, starts uh, at the low level and goes to the high level. So my first question I'll direct to Rob. Uh, you put a lot into creating this uh, view of the world. Rob, can you walk us through it? Sure. And it, it may be a bit outdated now. I mean, I remember we were sitting in a room about 18 months ago trying to figure out what we wanted to do in big data uh, in terms of IBM software, what we were going to go build. And so we started creating a map that said, how do we think the world is going to look 18 months from now, a few years from now? So there's probably some names that are already out of date uh, here. But the thought was we said, look, there's going to be a core layer of people just providing value around open source. We, we've seen that many times. It's a pattern that repeats itself. Um, that's what you kind of see in the middle there. We saw people were going to play at the bottom, provide connectors, integration, some type of connectivity, storage. We saw those as interesting spaces. But as we looked at, so where do we want to place our bet in terms of our engineering talent and what we're going to go build, we saw more value up the stack. So our priority right away became, how do we go build out an analytical platform for big data? So a place where you can ingest all of your data, multi-petibytes of data, all different types of data, how can you bring it into one place and help enterprises make sense of it? And then we can go partner around tools and how do you visualize that data, how do you explore that data? We can go partner for applications running on top of that platform. So, so our focus in the short term, in a sense based on this original drawing on a whiteboard was we want to provide a platform we're going to partner. We might actually build some capabilities or buy some capabilities in other spaces, but we saw this as a great chance to go help enterprises solve this problem. So I think it's probably changed a little bit, Dave, but I think ho hopefully it's a good basis for discussion. Yeah, I think it is a good basis. And, and Clint Alpine Data Labs occupies a spot at the, the top of this stack. Is that, a, is that a good place to be? Definitely good for us. Um, a lot of opportunity as uh, pieces in the stack lower down um, are firming up, becoming more mainstream uh, and, and more widely accepted. Then as an application provider on top of the stack, we have a lot more uh, entree into both the small and medium-sized businesses that have never had access to these tools before, as well as some enterprise uh, solutions. Uh, we, have, we have a chance to go in and sell new technologies. Uh, some are, are game-changing in this analytics space. 
So, Rob, as an entrepreneur, and obviously in a VC firm where you're seeing people with new companies every week, and one question that's always asked is, well, in the competitive dynamics with large companies, where are the large companies going to go and maybe where aren't they going to go? Any advice for the entrepreneurial community that you're able to, uh, to talk about that would kind of help them think about where on this map might be IBM's turf, so to speak, and where there might be opportunities for new standalone companies? So, well, let me describe the opportunity because I, it's partially an opportunity because I think we do it very poorly, and, and a lot of other big companies do too. Um, I'll give you an example. We, we bought Natiza about a year ago. We, we already have like 15 databases in IBM. We've already got a warehouse. <laughs> so you probably wonder, so why did we go spend almost $2 billion for Natiza? It's, it's because Natiza made the data warehousing problem incredibly easy to solve. That was their value proposition. We'll make it incredibly easy. Um, that's also what I see as the opportunity in big data. So if I was building a company in big data, it would be, I would be focused on how do I make this incredibly easy for the enterprise to adopt. Uh, I'm in a bunch of these big clients every week right now, and while they do proof of concepts and science projects, they get started, they're really struggling with this problem. So the, whether it's delivering tools, delivering visualization, delivering apps, I would say if you can do, make this problem incredibly easy, you're going to find a lot of clients out there. Todd, as an EIR at, uh, at Battery, you get the advantage of looking at basically anything you want to look at. Mm -hmm. Anything <laughs> exciting that you're seeing in, in big data that you can tell us about? Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. I think just to kind of follow on from what Rob was saying, you know, when, when I look at the marketplace, you know, thinking about where would I start a company, it's definitely not at the bottom level at the infrastructure. I, I think that window has closed and that, that layer now is saturated with a whole bunch of different people, whether it's Hortonworks or EMC or Cloudera or Datastax or Mongo or all of those guys, right? And it's not clear to me that people really want to pay for infrastructure in this space. I think people are used to it being open source. They think that's free. It isn't because you still need 20 Hadoop developers to kind of build an app. But, you know, the, the value I that... I hope you're wrong that people don't want to pay for infrastructure, <laughs> by the way. No, well, I, 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 you'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> I don't think people want to pay for infrastructure, but they do want to pay for analytics, right? So the value accrues at the top of this graph, right? Which is, so if you're thinking about starting a company, where would I be aiming now? Don't be aiming at a new infrastructure piece, right? What you want to be aiming at is, you know, the next window, I think, is a set of tools and application building to help people build applications. You don't have to be a programmer. But fundamentally, I think, you know, the big goal here for us in the big data industry is to say, we've created this new job description called data scientist. But I look at that and say, I think that's kind of like an accident of time at this point, which is a data scientist is either a business analyst who is technical and can write some programs, or a programmer who has some interest in data. And realistically, what we want to do is say, every business analyst who sits in Excel or whatever tool they have now, what, they, what we need to be able to do as an industry is say, allow them to do the job of the data scientist without having to learn to program. And so over the course of kind of like the next three to five years, I think we see...
kind of drive by data or dark information, the, in, the sort of information that gets thrown off by our, oh, are we good now? <laughs> we'll stop oh, now you're telling me to be quiet. Now be quiet. Screw you. Uh, <laughs> um, Tough crowd here today. <laughs> so it's this idea, this information that gets thrown off, kind of this dark matter almost, that gets thrown off by our own activities. Because too often what, we're, what we try to do in terms of creating startups in, this, in, 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 in big data is try to change people's behaviors and not recognize that an awful lot of the things we do that generates interesting data is really already thrown off by, by what we're doing because we choose to do it, you know, our activities. And so I'm really interested in, in instrumenting those activities, you know, it's the, sort of the smart dust ideas and so on. But, you know, there's so many interesting trivial and non-trivial applications, and I'll give you just a, sort of a trivial application then one that's an investment. The trivial applications are things like, you ever play with things like ski tracks and things like that on, on your iPhone? I mean, these things are just like data nirvana. I mean, where you can literally, you, you turn it on when you're skiing, and it'll give you at the end of the day, you know, how stupidly fast you went on that one run where you forgot what you were doing. It tells you all the, the, you know, all the runs you went on. It's smart enough to recognize that when I rise 100 feet, it's not because I went over a huge jump. It's because I'm on a lift. Um, all this kind of information, and it all gets thrown off. And what's really interesting now is that some of the ski tracks data, and the data like that, is being recognized by resorts as fantastic information about flow on their own mountains, right? So it starts off as I instrument my activities, but it turns around then what you're really creating is a bunch of instruments, people, skiing up and down the mountain to generate secondary data, and that data then goes back, if you choose to, in an anonymized fashion, back to ski hills. And it's almost like what you're seeing happen on roadways and other places. So this idea of sort of instrumenting people's activities and, and having it flow back. And so I'm, I'm doing that now with a, a small company I'm just actually closing an investment in that's uh, doing that using GPS watches, and so it's got a hardware component to it, and the data will flow back from that uh, those, all of these devices that are collecting information to a community. It's actually a, a female-centric sort of competitive sports community. And, uh, and it's a fabulous thing because, again, we're aggregating all this information from things that people are doing already. We're not trying to change people's behavior. We're just instrumenting that behavior and then extracting patterns and competitive information and uh, uh, relative comparison information all coming back out, out of that. Did we just lose ourselves again? All all, all you coming did, back. but you're back again. Yes, I'm back again. <laughs> all come, coming out of that kind of thing. So that's, that's one sort of area that, and, and, and in terms of an existing investment, the other area that I'm really passionate about in terms of big data is news analytics. You're trying to extract information and help lead people to you know, better and more relevant and more current information, again, by monitoring what other people are reading. Not just in sort of uh, you know, New York Times, other people also read, you know, here's the five most popular articles, you know, much more granular ideas around what constitutes peer groups and what constitutes interestingness. And I have a, you know, a little company called Smarter that um, we seeded about a year ago or so that's doing some really interesting stuff in that area. And it's, again, it's around this idea of using the information you already throw off to try and extract notions of interestingness and relevance and everything else and using that large data set and all the patterns, but trying not to change your behavior. You're just doing something, and as a byproduct of what you're doing, it throws off data, and I want that data. So for my next question, which may create some controversy, I'm just going to say one word and ask the panelists uh, to just have a free-forming free uh, response to the, to the word, and the word is Hadoop. And Rob, maybe I'll start with you. So I, I would contend that next year, so 2012, is going to be the year of failure in Hadoop. But I, I'm not sure any of us will know about it, per se. And the reason I say that is I, as I go into big enterprises, I, w I was at one client last week. They bring into a room 29 people that are all working on different use cases around Hadoop. Um, right now, they don't rely on it. So they tell their, you know, their counterparts that they're building it for, you know, use it, but don't rely on it. It'll be good enough. Next year, people are going to start putting this stuff into production and not just production for, you know, analytics overnight. They're going to really use it in key functions of the business. And I think it's going to break. We, we see, you know, issues with data loss. We see issues with security. So, so things will break. And so people will kind of backpedal and say, well, should we really be doing this? Um, I think it will just be a ripple on, on the whole spectrum. But we've kind of shifted our investment in the last six months anticipating that. So we're putting more around tooling. We've built a much bigger team to go work with clients on this because we feel like if we can help them be successful, it'll make it a much smaller ripple. So, so Hadoop to me means failure next year in the enterprise, um, but that will just be a little blip and then we'll be back on the road. Todd, you've been embedded in Hadoop for the last wow. few years, so yes. any comments on... Uh, I 
I'm going to be somewhat split personality here. I think that on the one hand, I think, you know, Hadoop is kind of like the Linux of data warehousing, has the opportunity to supplant all of the folks like Rob here by, you know, basically blowing apart the traditional data warehousing, um, you know, platforms. On the other side of it, though, you know, I think we're currently at the kind of like trough of disillusionment, or just approaching the trough of disillusionment around Hadoop where, you know, people are like, okay, I hear about Hadoop, you know, but we're, we're not Yahoo, we're not Facebook, we don't have like, you know, 100 engineers to work on this stuff. How, what, what value can I get out of it? Oh man, this is hard, right? I've got to have a team of 20 people. This isn't that much cheaper than this traditional thing. So I, I think, you know, the next couple of years, and I think it takes a little bit longer than 12 months, is a couple of years we'll see that market solidify out and, you know, start to become a de facto part of your data infrastructure. And when it is, you better bet that it's always on and it's always there. Because if you're using it for making real decisions about your business close to real time, it has to be reliable. Yeah. So, Clint, I guess where the rubber hits the road, you're shipping a real app that's solving real problems for real customers. Is Hadoop a supported platform in your product line? Uh, not at the moment, but it's on the roadmap. Hadoop may, may not be enterprise ready yet, uh, to your point. Uh, but it's becoming u ubiquitous uh, it, just because of its cost and accessibility, uh, whether it's uh, local downloads and installations or whether uh, companies are going out to Amazon and spinning up Hadoop instances there. Uh, it's going to be everywhere, and it's going to be important for us to, uh, to be able to connect into Hadoop and actually uh, do data processing through uh, Alpine Miner, our primary tool, uh, in the Hadoop environment. Uh, another, another thing, though, that we see uh, just common use cases for, for uh, companies that are using Hadoop now. We see traditional statisticians, data miners, um, folks working in a, in a Hadoop environment. They're pulling data out of Hadoop. They're landing it in a, a local database or some other engine where they can process it using uh, traditional tools. And so a big opportunity for us is to uh, give, a, give data mining capabilities uh, that work directly into the Hadoop instance. Um, something on our roadmap next year. So maybe as a follow-up uh, Hadoop question, and again, maybe uh, some controversy here as well, do you see the world uh, as things play out having multiple Hadoop distributions, or do you see a single Hadoop distribution? Is there a benefit to one versus the other? Uh, please, anyone, feel free to answer that. I think Todd, it, you're the best guy to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we'll see multiple distributions. I mean, I, we see that in Linux, but you also have the core common kernel, right? And so I think that, you know, when you think about Hadoop, Hadoop means a lot of things to people, right? It, is it just HDFS and MapReduce? Okay, that's what Hadoop is. Or is it HDFS and MapReduce and Pig and HBase and Hive and all of the other stuff that goes together? And so I think as people start to assemble the ecosystem of components into distributions, like we see Cloudera doing, for example, you're going to see slightly different flavors of those. I personally am obviously invested and believe passionately that I think Apache should be the default distribution of the core of it, right? I mean, I think, you know, we've, we've shown that open source can build incredibly complicated infrastructure. If you, you think about how the internet grew up, it really grew up because of open source, right? The core infrastructure pieces around the internet were open source. And I think we're starting to do the same thing now with in cloud, you know, not just big data, but in cloud, the core infrastructure I think will be open source. Uh, and the same thing with Hadoop down at the core. Right? But but for the same, and for the same reason, though, as has been the case in, you know, in Linux and open source in general, and I think you made this point earlier, it's one of the reasons why, you know, at least as, a, as an early stage investor, you know, it, it's not a particularly interesting area right now because it, it's, obvious, it's, it's a given and therefore it's sort of uninvestable, right? You know what I mean? It's, sort of, it's dial tone, it's alternating current, it's, it's Linux, and it's the basis for so much of what we do. So everything that's interesting has to happen higher than that. So I always find it strange when I, I'll see a pitch from someone when the whole emphasis of the pitch is something clever they're doing with Hadoop, which to me is like doing something clever with a Linux printer driver. I mean, it's, <laughs> I'm delighted you figured out something clever to do, but I don't honestly care. So, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that, you know, all of the infrastructure becomes open source and is commoditized yeah. already pretty much, right? And, you know, if, even if you're building a cloud startup or you're building a big data startup, you do not want to be down there. You don't want You've to got be to be higher up. That's where the value accrues. Right. It doesn't mean right? it's not valuable. It's hugely valuable. Right. It's just from an investing standpoint. It's not and I think the business model is completely different, right? That, you know, down to the infrastructure layer, the business model is training, support, packaging, you know, mentoring, all of that stuff, right? And you can build fantastic businesses there like, you know, SpringSource did or JBoss. But, but further can, up can, the can stack, you build five fantastic businesses there? Five fantastic businesses, 
I think that's tough. I, so I, th I think there will the further be. further up you go. <laughs> I, I think there will be, but I think it's, for the world I'm primarily focused on, the enterprise, it, it's very bad for enterprises. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, right now there's four or five different lines of development in Apache, and so we spend the first four days with the client trying to figure out what are they using now, why are they using that, is it up to sync with ours? So it's just, it's a total waste of time, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with Todd. Our, our commitment is to, to Apache. The only reason we ship it is because there's GPL code right now in Apache, and we don't, our lawyers don't like us shipping that. But our desire would be we don't want to ship, we don't want to be in the distribution business. We're happy to have multiple distribution guys out there that, that we can partner with, but we're trying to make this consumable in the enterprise. And I, I think if, if you get four or five distributions that have a lot of momentum, I think that makes it really tough in enterprises. You, in a way, you wall yourself out by being wed to one. Mm -hmm. I think the interesting thing here is, though, like, people, you know, think of Hadoop as synonymous with big data or the other way around. And, and you could make a, a reasonable argument that there wouldn't be any big data industry if it wasn't for Hadoop. But Hadoop is not the be-all and end-all of big data, right? I mean, there's a bunch of other things out there that go into the landscape that are requirements out there. If you think about what does your real big data infrastructure need to be in kind of like three to five years, you know, it needs to support streaming, it needs to scale out, it needs to support real-time updates, right? It needs to support search, it needs to support, you know, a bunch of other things. That's not all Hadoop. So I actually think that, you know, the way I look at the market is, you know, 30 years ago someone invented the RDBMS, and that was really the first data fabric and basically spawned 30 years or 20 years of innovation in the BI industry in the structured world. We're kind of at the cusp now where I think the next data fabric gets created, and that spawns the next 20, 30 years' worth of innovation and development in the unstructured world or the big data world. And in two years' time, we won't even be calling it big data. We'll be calling it something else. Right? You know, Bigger data. <laughs> Bigger data, right, exactly. <laughs> Google data or something, whatever it is. Well, right? that would, probably you know, not. Just <laughs> new data, right, whatever it is, right? I mean, I think it's different, right? But, it, you know, I think, well, I think that's where we're at in this industry. It's so immature. People are still trying to figure out how to put their basic building blocks together. We're going to get through that phase and then be able to focus on what are the real applications. Ultimately, people want to pay for analytics and applications. They don't want to pay for infrastructure much. Well, and less, and less so now more than ever, though. I mean, they've been kind mm -hmm. of weaned on that. So. Right. I think, you know, I, and I actually, I like to use the analogy more of the app server market than the database market. And I know everybody jumps to the database market because it's, I'd say it's very clear in warehousing. But... The reason the app server market was, was good for enterprises was it gave them this notion of, you know, an enterprise service bus. People could really, to some extent, standardize their infrastructure and put their investments into things that were more interesting and driving actual business outcomes as opposed to purely infrastructure. That's not been the database in the data warehousing world. So um, we're hoping that, you know, all of us together can take big data. I'd say more down that analogy because it's better for the enterprises and less down the, you know, you need 100 different tools and 100 different data stores just to do, you know, basic yeah. q and A. I I think, I think the next gen data fabric is the next generation middleware, right? You yeah. know, we last, last decade it was all about the app server and basically moving up. I think where we get to the next gen middleware is moving up effectively to a data pass, right? Platform as a service, uh, where you're basically building applications on top of that. Whether it's on-premise or in the cloud, that's the future, right? And this, you know, the next decade we'll see massive amount of innovation, value creation and investment in and around this kind of like next generation middleware, the data middleware. We're going to steal that term, next generation middleware. <laughs> okay. One. I'll see it in, like see it in your slides. Right. Yeah, you'll, you'll see it shortly. It'll be trademarked. <laughs> Quick, someone trademark it for me. <laughs> Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we've uh, run out of time. I've been uh, asked to pay attention to the clock that's sitting uh, right here in front of me, and we're counting down uh, to exactly your end of time. But uh, Julie did suggest if we did have uh, a question or two, we'd be able to take them. So, uh, so Julie, if you wanted to moderate that, we're happy to take a question or two. Yes, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one or maybe two quick questions. So let's start with the gentleman in the back over here. Do, I think we have a microphone. Yeah. Uh, a question for Paul Gadrowski. Uh, you had mentioned two investments, and you had mic problems on the second one. One had to do with the instrumentation of the skiing and the watches, <laughs> and the other one was uh, some sort of a media analysis. What was the name of that product? Uh, S-M-A-R-T-R, -R, Smarter. Smart Smarter. Car. Yeah, yeah. And that's a, a, a little, like news analytics, literally. And I mean, and it's, again, predicated this on an idea of leveraging what other people are doing and using that as a, as, a, as a trigger and a signal for, you know, giant data set of information detecting stuff that has, you know, a high degree of interestingness in, a, in narrowly defined communities, but doing without changing your behaviors. It all happens sort of incidentally. So Thank you. by all means, go download, try it out, and 
find someone to spend a lot of money on it. <laughs> we could take one more question if there is one. Okay. Great. Thank you all Thank very you much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.